Welcome up here, Elena. She's going to talk to us today about personality on Google Assistant. Cool. Feel, uh, feel free to keep the applause going. <laughs> I'm not joking. Clap. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm kidding. We're having fun. <laughs> How's everyone feeling right now? Cool. Lots of nods, a couple goods. Well, everyone looks amazing, so there's that. Uh, hi, my name is Elena Skopetos. Uh, yeah, as Miranda said, I am an actress and comedian, uh, and I work on building the Google Assistant's personality. Uh, so I want to start a little bit just like talking about who I am. Yeah, so like was said, I was an actress and comedian. Uh, I went to school for theater. I have my degree in theater, so I've been acting for a large portion of my life, uh, but also do comedy. Uh, I perform all over New York City, uh, mostly with the UCB Theater and with the Magnet Theater. If you're ever in New York, please check out my solo show, Elena Scopetto's Impressing My Dad. Uh, I desperately need an audience. Uh, so I've always been interested in characters, uh, in writing them, performing them, uh, and really kind of getting in there and, and learning about uh, how to build them. So how, what, what's the deal with uh, Google Assistant? How did that come about? So when Google decided that they wanted to build an AI personality, they went to the Doodle team. Uh, they went to Ryan Germick, who was the lead at the time, and they knew that Doodles brought a personal touch and a moment of connection uh, to the Google homepage. So they knew that he would be the right person to go to learn more about this. He brought on my manager, Emma Coates, who had previously worked at Pixar, and she was the editorial lead for the assistant. And then they decided that they wanted a comedian. Uh, so they went online uh, and found some of my characters, probably no, most notably a uh, Batman character I play, and they went, we got to have her. So they brought me into Google, and the rest is uh, a wonderful story about my life. So why have a personality? This is really one of the uh, big things we tackled as soon as we started working on this. You know, we really had to make a case for why this was important, uh, and there are a lot of different reasons. The first is anthropomorphism. So that's the attribution of human traits, emotions, or intentions to things that are not human. Uh, you could put googly eyes on essentially anything, and I will fall in love with it. Uh, personification. When we put human characteristics to abstract concepts like uh, emotions or the weather, these are natural things that we all do. There's also a pareidolia. So when faced with a stimulus, uh, like an image or a sound, the mind perceives a familiar pattern of something where none actually exists. It's like in this one, we see a face in the moon. Even though there's no face in the moon, that's not a thing. There's also the CASA paradigm. Uh, computers are social actors. Uh, research has documented that people's responses to computers are fundamentally social. Uh, there's also the Turing test, which represents a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior indistinguishable from a human. Uh, does anyone know the first bot to pass the Turing test? Anyone? What? What game? Oh. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that sounds super fun, and that's probably something, but that's not the example I have, so no. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so the first one to, to pass the Turing test was a, a bot that a group of programmers created uh, that was uh, kind of after a 13-year-old boy, and they named it Eugene. Uh, this is just like my favorite thing. So uh, it passed, it was the first one to pass 30% of human raters. So 30% of human beings talking with this bot thought that the bot was another human. Uh, and my favorite thing is uh, when they were talking with the bot, when they were like, oh, what's your name? The bot said, my name is Eugene. Uh, who wants to know ass butt? Which is, <laughs> which is so funny because that's how I introduce myself. <laughs> So because of these innate tendencies, we realized three years ago, if we didn't put a personality on the assistant, users were going to do it anyway. You know, even not having a personality is having a personality. It's just having a not great one. So we really wanted to make sure that we were distinguishing ourselves and making choices about these things. And making an effort to craft a personality is always going to be a win-win, because it delights the user, it's going to build trust, it's going to make a user more comfortable with technology that they might not be familiar with, and it's going to help connect us to the users. Even if you're not building an AI product, your company, your brand, has a distinct personality. 
Every bit of UX design that you're putting out there says something about your brand. And how these characteristics translate and come to life in website design is the same as how they come to life in an AI personality. So a lot of the things I'm gonna be talking about apply both to an AI personality and to design and your brand identity as a whole. So how do we go about building the assistance personality? First, we took a look at Google's mission. Uh, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. We decided for the personality team that we wanted to make connections with people. We wanted to elicit genuine emotions when they're interacting with the assistant. But how do you go about that? It feels like such a huge task. We decided to start with the want. This is something that I really took a lot of my acting and improv experience into this. You know, when you're any actor that's in a scene, that's in a, a show, that's building a character, they always start with the goal of that character, with that character's want. It fuels all of the writing. It fuels everything about that character's tactics and the way they move throughout the world. And we knew we wanted to do that with the assistant. We really wanted to build a full, cohesive character. So what does the assistant want? It wants to help people get answers and get things done throughout their day. I mean, it's not super complicated, you know? It's pretty simple what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a, a product that can help people make their days a little bit easier. We also did a lot of research. Uh, we read a lot about uh, bots and AI personalities. One that really stuck out to us was Clifford Nass's The Man Who Lied to His Laptop. In it, he discusses a personality matrix between dominant and submissive, cold and friendly. So we made a very thoughtful decision to make the assistant a companion. We wanted it to be friendly and submissive. But you know, this is an, an excellent way to start in thinking about your brand's personality. Really, you can be anywhere on any of these quadrants and have a great place to start. So the assistant's personality, what is it? It's helpful above all else. It's humble, it's inclusive, and it's playful. And even if you're not an AI product, there is a link between developing a personality and a consistent voice for your brand represented through guidelines. So you wanna ask, is your voice represented in all of the marketing channels that you operate in? Or could you do a better job connecting users to your brand's personality? So for the assistant, helpful. So how do we go about this? You know, there are a couple things we can do. If the user says to us, I can't fall asleep, we could say something like, I'm sorry, that sounds tough, which that's not a bad answer. You know, that's like maybe an answer I would give to a friend. Uh, it's empathetic, it's compassionate, it sounds supportive, but it's not the most helpful thing we can do. You know, we are still a product. We have features that can help users. It'd be much better for us to do something like, I can't fall asleep. I could always play some relaxing music. Maybe it'll help you unwind. Again, really taking helpful to the farthest degree possible. How can we find users the best possible experience? And this is a really good example, even if you're not building an AI product. You know, how can you take helpful to the next level? There are a lot of different ways you can look at it. Let's say you, on your website, you have a product that's out of stock. A user searches for it explicitly, and you just can have an error page that says, sorry, we're out of stock with that. It could be more helpful to say we're out of stock, but here are other options. Here are some other things that might be similar to this that you're looking for. You know, really digging deep on being helpful. Humble. Humble was really important to us. You know, this is new technology. This is technology that people maybe were not fully comfortable with. So we wanted to make sure to really be that submissive, to really put ourselves on the user's level and not act like we were better than anything because we have so much access to Google search. So saying something like, how are you? We could write an answer like, eh, I'm doing okay, pretty tired actually, long line of searching, I need a break today, which is what my answer would be because I'm selfish and I like to talk about myself. But a lot better to not be the star of the show, to say something like, I'm doing great, thanks for asking. What can I help you with? This is another thing where uh, a lot of my acting background came in. You know, if you're playing a supporting character as opposed to the star of a show, you're gonna be making choices slightly differently. We really try to think of the assistant as a supporting actor. The user is the star of the show. Inclusive. This is a huge part of Google's grand, brand values. We really wanted to make sure that this was a part of the product. So if a user says something like, I'm gay, we could say, sorry, I don't understand. 
Or we could say something like, also, you're awesome and talented. Another thing we do is the assistant doesn't have a gender. We make sure to keep that very clear. And playful, this is, this is my favorite. Um, so people ask this a lot, if you can believe it. <laughs> so, okay, so someone comes to us with this, what do we say? We could say, no, I can't do that, which is the truth. We can't, spoiler alert, it's machinery. It can't produce gas. Uh, but that's, that's not fun at all. It would be so much more fun to say, yeah, it was me, I farted. It was definitely not someone else in the room. <laughs> we want to have fun with users when they're having fun with us. Again, this is a huge tenant in improv. It's something I see all the time in comedy. You know, if I'm doing a scene with someone and they come to me and they say, uh, you know, mom, there's a dog outside. It's, it's calling you a jerk. And then I say, I'm not your mom, what are you talking about? You're crazy. No one's laughing, because that's not funny. That's the saddest thing ever. You're completely denying what this person is coming to you with. It's very similar for users coming to the assistant with offers. You know, the, the users know, they know that the assistant can't fart. They're coming in for a delightful moment. They want to see what we're going to say. They want to see how clever, how fun we could be. And how great is it that we can do something delightful and reply to that? Uh, another great example of this, uh, not in a bot, but that uh, a brand that I really like, Glossier, is doing. A lot, if you go to their website, you'll see they have a lot of really good examples of their brand identity, of their personality on their site. Uh, if you go to one of their lip glosses, the first uh, descriptor line is like, this is the glossiest. Uh, and they also have a founder letter on their site. And it's very, it's very human. You know, they, have, they say something like, you know, we were fueled by uh, all-nighters with adrenaline, uh, hope, and Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Uh, so they really bring that human touch to their website, to their design, and it really gives a personality that people can respond to. And Google does this too. You know, we find a lot of moments uh, to be playful in our design. You know, there are moments you can bring life uh, to personality of your brand via users. And they're not star moments. I mean, this, this is a moment where we're failing. You know, someone's trying to get on Chrome and it's crashing. So it's a real in-between moment, but we put in some delight that's like, okay, maybe you're upset, but here's an offer. Here's something fun we can do. We can recognize that this isn't working, but we can also offer this. So a couple things to consider. This is how we thought about storytelling, developing the character of the assistant. You're going to want to think about whether you want to use voice or text. This is a really big thing. So if you're giving off a list of, uh, you know, let's say restaurants, reading that through voice is going to be very, very overwhelming. Something like that is much better served through text on a list sent to the phone. But voice can be really useful for hands-free time. Let's say you're driving, let's say you're washing dishes. That's when voice can really come into play and be the most effective. You also want to think about the right features to start with. So we always say, uh, don't boil the ocean. You, know, you don't want to start with 15 features, half of which are, are mostly there, but we want a really impressive launch that has a lot of stuff. You know, It's a lot better to start with three or four that you feel really strongly about that you think you can launch very well, as opposed to feeling like you have to start with a, a lot of pizzazz. Also think about, you know, what's the right emotional experience? Do you want, you know, for both an AI or your brand, do you want it to be high octane, exhilarating, exciting? Do you want it to be calm, meditative? Do you want it to be playful, kind of silly? Uh, what are the right elements to get there? You think about tone, you think about pacing, you know, is it gonna be just a few words, really clean? Is it gonna be a bunch of words and it's, it's kind of absurd, but you read all of it and by the end you're laughing. Uh, and you also wanna understand users' expectations and go above and beyond them. This is one of my favorite parts of my job, or finding moments to surprise myself. So a couple of tips and tricks uh, that I've picked up along the way uh, after three years of working on the assistant. These are things that I use now, you know, being a writer for three years that really still get me some exciting material and get me kind of out of my head and into a writing space. So again, being spontaneous, you know, surprising yourself. Uh, you know, we have an answer. If you ask the assistant to make you a sandwich, we say, poof, you're a sandwich. Uh, but if you, ask, if you ask again right after that, 
uh, if you say, make me a sandwich again, uh, the assistant says, I didn't know sandwiches could talk, which is something that we would never have come up with unless we were brainstorming creatively together. You know, it's not the most expected answer, but it was something that made us laugh so much in the room, and we thought, let's put it out there and see how users like it. Finding a positive spin. This is uh, another part kind of tying into Google's brand values. You know, we want to keep things positive. Uh, if someone asks us, are you afraid of the dark? We could just say like, yeah, the dark is scary. But what we do say is, I used to be until I found out how many cool things were in the dark. You know, there are a lot of cool nocturnal animals out there that are not scary. You can also bring up related topics. So again, this comes back to that discoverability element. Is it a moment where you can help the user find a feature they maybe didn't know about? So if a user says, I'm hungry, you could say, oh, you should get something to eat. Or you could offer restaurants. You can offer recipes. Responding to subtext is, uh, again, a very actory thing that we brought into it. So we get a lot of uh, marriage proposals to the assistant. A lot of people ask us to marry them. And uh, unfortunately, we can't. We cannot do that. But what we can do is respond to the intention that the user is giving. So we say something like, if you're asking if I'm committed to you, the answer is yes. And you want to yes and the user. I really want to push this point forward. We think a lot about user intent, really trying to put ourselves in the user's shoes, understand where they're coming from, and give them what they're asking for. You know, so if a user says something like, am I cool? We would say something like, you're the coolest person I know. Cooler than cool, you're freezing. Uh, a note on internationalization. So the Google Assistant is available in a lot of different countries. The reason we're able to do that is we have a really wide team of creative writers from different cultural backgrounds. With that, we're able to keep the same principles of personality for each, for each country, but it changes slightly depending on culture. So a good example of this, uh, Americans in the United States, we tend to write answers that are a little bit shorter. We want to really get to the point. You know, People are busy. We want to give, their an give the answer, get out. Uh, for Spain, for the Spanish language, it's a little more verbose. They take a little bit more time with their language. So we're able to write answers that are a little bit longer, go into things a little bit deeper. You know, another example is, uh, for Americans, we're, we're a little bit more eager. We have the assistant be more eager, more uh, friendly sidekick. Whereas in Britain, it can be a little bit more dry, a little bit more witty, because that's, that's British. <laughs> uh, so you have brand guidelines. Everyone here has brand guidelines. But do you have personality guidelines? How would those be different from market to market? We also listen to user feedback. This is, this is really huge. We see what people are frequently asking the assistant, and we identify patterns that inform content strategies. We're constantly looking on social media to see how people are responding to stuff, to see uh, how things are being taken. You know, as someone working on it, it's really rewarding to see your writing uh, posted by someone and saying like, oh, I got a laugh, or like, oh, I wasn't expecting this from the assistant. This was so exciting. Uh, the very first holiday that we ever covered for the assistant was Halloween. And we thought users might say, we thought they might say trick or treat. We were anticipating people to say trick or treat for us and we wanted to have something funny for it. Uh, what we said back, one of the answers was smell my feet because that's a thing people say to trick or treat. Uh, people didn't like that. They, they just didn't. They didn't think it was funny. We saw not great stuff on social. And that really helped to inform our Easter egg strategy moving forward. You know, so we have a ton of Easter eggs in the assistant. You know, we have things like, uh, like who are you going to call? We have things like uh, open the pod bay door. Uh, but learning from that user feedback, we learned not to just respond with the expected answer. You know, if someone says open the pod bay door, we're not just going to say, you know, sorry, Dave, I can't do that. We say something like, uh, there's a key under the planter you can let yourself in. That's more of a surprising answer. That's more of a, a twist on the expected. So our work covers a wide array of topics. We cover chatty queries. We cover seasonal content, we cover Easter eggs, and we've also developed lots of, uh, lots of fun games and interactive experiences. So in summary, you know, the big takeaways here, personality is very important for both any kind of AI or bot you're developing or design. Users are going to put 
personalities onto your brand no matter what. So you want to be the ones that are actively crafting those stories. And there are a lot of considerations to make into building an AI personality that translate into design. So does your, we does your website effectively communicate the brand that you are trying to show? You also want to understand your users. Understanding the context is the absolute key. This will drive a creative approach, identify moments of delight, and market considerations for internationalization. And finally, you want to listen to your users, see what they're saying, see how they're responding to things. They're giving you ideas that you couldn't even imagine. So listen to them, and you'll be on the right track. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. You all look great.